All right, everybody, welcome back to the uh, Twisted History podcast. So Twisted History typically goes and takes something from history, and we pull it apart. We do a bunch of left turns, and we try to make people smarter on something that they probably should have learned before. We're doing a interview this time, for the first time ever. For people who don't know who Stu Finer is, you'll know in a couple of minutes. Yo, you'll fucking know. So we're going to take a guy that most people know and adore, some people fucking hate, but most people lo- uh, know and adore, and I love the guy. Flat out love, kiss on the mouth type love. And we're going to find out what he's done from the womb all the way on his road towards the tomb. Stu, welcome aboard. Thank you, Large. I love you. God bless you. Okay. May God be with you and your family. Full name. Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T, Mitchell Finer, F-E-I-N-E-R, S-M-F. Stuart, (laughs) sick motherfucker. Stuart Mitchell Finer, when were you born? Uh, January 31st, 1961. Which makes you? I am 61 years old. You're 61 years old. Where were you born, Stu? Um, Mamabedi's Hospital in Brooklyn, New York. So you're a Brooklyn boy at heart? Correct. I moved out to Long Island when I was uh, 10 years old, fourth grade, summer of fourth grade, March of fourth grade. So you lived in, oh, so where'd you live in Brooklyn? Uh, beach, well, I, I, we lived in the Beach Haven Apartments that Fred Trump owned. It was 2662 West 2nd Street. There's about 40 uh, six-story brick buildings that Fred Trump owned, and we were on uh, the sixth floor of one of them. And who are your parents? Uh, Howard Finer, no middle name, mm-hmm. and Claire. Your Faye, dad doesn't have a middle name. No middle name. Okay. And Claire Faye Cookie Larue Finer. Really? Yeah. And uh, mom has been dead since two thousand two. She died of breast cancer. And your dad, though, is still with us, and he's still cook, uh, cooking, kicking. And I've had the pleasure of meeting him multiple times. Tell me about your pop. Uh, you know, listen, he's a. Listen, he's all gas, no brakes also. Mm-hmm. I mean, he loves everyone. You know, he's a staunch Republican. He, uh, in his later years, which he got into it, um, he got his FFL license, Federal Firearms License, and he was able to sell guns to ex-military, ex-police, ex-detectives. And that's his pride and joy. And that's his pride and joy. And that's really uh, how he's, like, living right now. It's, like, absolutely crazy. But, you know, he, um, by his own admission, has had a very, very, very tough life. Okay. And I want to hear all about it. But I think it's interesting that you're the son of a Jewish arms dealer from Brooklyn. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And you had that happen to you. So, and for people who don't know why I like Stu so much... Stu is arguably the most generous person I know, first and foremost. And Stu and I hate a lot of the same people. So we actually have conversations every now and again. Those people don't need to be named. Annie. Thank God. Right, right. But it's, it's one never of those things Annie. Where it's we can, never fucking Annie. But it's one of those things where we can speak frankly, like yes. adults and stuff yes, like that. Absolutely. So that's, that's where our relationship is. So, <laughs> so your dad, you had told me a story, too. That you'd found like a cache of rifles, right? Like the classic rifles and whatnot, like under oh, the bed? rifles, handguns, ammunition, as if like, you know, as if his World War Three is in Viceroy, Long Island, where he lived. It was crazy when we were cleaning his house. Yeah, we had to clean his house out of everything. And uh, it was a scary situation. It was fucking scary. Talk to me about his upbringing. What made his life so tough? I think this all sets up. To obviously the story that people will find familiar. So if you don't mind talking about it, I'm going to ask you about it. No, no, no. Anything anything goes, as as always. Um, His father died when he was 13. Okay, he had an older sister and a younger brother. And his mother remarried. And he never got along with uh, her new husband. Uh, My grandfather that I never knew, obviously, when he died, uh, owned a delicatessen and a candy store. And my father worked with his father. And he was the only person that worked in the house. The younger brother didn't, his older sister didn't. And he was the middle child, and he felt like he got fucked. He really did. He felt like the younger, his younger brother could do no wrong, and his older sister could do no wrong. And he never got along with his mother after his father died. That was the story that he passed on to me. Okay. And he moved out of the house 
uh, when he was 16 years old. But as the years went on, it went younger. Like, I knew the story for 20 years as fact, 16. But then as he got into his 70s, he moved out when he was 15. Then 75, moved out when he was 14. Then, like, in his 80s, now he moved out when he was 11. You know, like, I don't, you know what I mean? But I remember, we're going we're gonna to lock in 16. Okay. And he moved out of his house, and he lived on his own. And he had to work to help his younger brother uh, finish college, his older sister finish college, and his mother with the bills until she actually put herself uh, into the second marriage. And then he really has really never had a good relationship with her. And I know this for a fact because on, let's say, the Rosh Hashanah and the Passover holidays, which is the only time I ever saw my father's side of the family ever, 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 would be Rosh Hashanah and Passover. And at Passover meals, at Rosh Hashanah meals, they would be knocked down, drag out fights in the middle of the table. Like, uh -huh. my father uh, is a definitive rageaholic. Like, when he believes something, whether it's true or not, and I would say half of the things he believes are actually not true. They, they don't exist. Sure. But he doubles down in a way that that rage comes out, and he's a rageaholic. So um, my father has always been angry, an extremely hard worker. And why I feel bad is he never caught a fucking break in his life. Like everything that was supposed to happen, something failed, whether it was on his own volition or somebody fucked him or just life didn't go well. But he's the type of guy that every single thing in his life went bad. He never caught a break. I'm talking never, ever, ever caught a break. It was just absolutely unbelievable. And I, you know, throughout my whole life, my father has been angry, like super duper tight, super duper angry. Uh, my mother on the other hand, direct opposite of that, you know, people please, uh, loving, happy worries about everyone else would make a ton of food. We, it was only me, my father, my mother, my brother. But there would be food in the house for like 20 fucking people. And my mother used to say, I don't know who's coming over. I'm like, mom, what are you talking about? Dad's broke. You're making food. My father would come home and just, you know, lose his mind. Like, we don't have any money. And they always fought about money. Like, uh, since I was like six years old in Brooklyn, they fought about money. My mother would yell at my father, you're not making enough money. My father would be like, what do you mean? I'm working 18 hours a day. You know, I'm trying to do the best I can. And they always fought about money. And uh, so my father has had a very, very tough life. But he has like, he has a memory that he doesn't remember anything. So, so things that bother him and, or things that you would figure would crush other people, like the next day's a brand new day. It's unbelievable. My father would be a lunatic raging, spitting out of his mouth on a Tuesday. And then on Wednesday morning, it was nothing ever happened. Like he has, like there's no recollection. It doesn't follow through. Today's a new day, new day, new day. Let's go. You treat him, well, which I find, I, so my father's my hero, right? So one off, that, that's something that you should know right away. Um, but you do treat your father with a, a certain degree of reverence, which I don't think is put on. But your dad is a character. Like he wears the captain's hat, I brought you in and all this. Yeah, like he's a little bit of a character and whatnot. Was he a good dad? Um Because I'm going to talk about how you, are, how you are with your kids and when, stuff like that. Was uh, your dad a he, good dad? I, I, like, how are we qualifying good dad? Um, did he love me unconditionally? Yes. Did he give me the balls and the confidence to know that I can do anything and no one is better than me and there's nothing I can't accomplish? Absolutely. Um, was he rough around the edges? Yes. Did he not have the ability to verbalize or share feelings, especially when he was in his 40s? 50s, even his 30s, when I was like super young, uh, he didn't have the ability to verbalize that. He thought that no, whatever the situation is, he was just like, just fucking do it. You know what I mean? Just okay. do it. Just do it. And the, the, the thing I hesitate with, listen, was he a good dad? I love him to death. Would I trade him in for anybody? Absolutely not. But I went through a lot of insane situations that were catastrophic, that would have cracked most other people, I believe, that would have, you know, fractured other people. Like, I'm, a fr I'm like an adult child still because I'm fractured with a lot of well, things. When you talk about these situations yourself, are you talking about personally, professionally? Personally. Like, okay. he, like he, was, he was physical with my mother. Okay. 
he was he was physical with my mother. That would be enough for a lot of people to to write your dad off. Right. That'd be enough. That would be enough. As you know, particularly nowadays. Right. Right. And I don't mean that that you know. No, no, no. Right now, if like he that. did what he did, then he'd be in jail. Right. They, okay. they, no, there wouldn't be an issue. Okay. He'd be in jail. And my mother was supposed to put him in jail like three or four times. That when the cops came, she would chicken out because mm-hmm. she didn't want to be alone. You know. So my mother, when I went into therapy. You know, because if you go into therapy, they always say a, a man has to deal with the father issues. So when I tried to deal with all my father issues, it was a fucking nightmare. It was a horror show. I, like, I would be a basket case talking about it, and then it would affect me after I left the therapist's office where I'd have to go smoke a joint. I'd have to go smoke 10 joints. I'd have to eat 10,000 calories worth of sugar and carbs just to numb myself because to bring myself, you know, like my old trainer would say, you have to face yeah. You have to trace and then you have to erase. I never was able to erase. I could face it. I can trace it, but I was never able to erase it. I still hold on to a lot of things. And why are you so, so open to talk about it now? Like I'm, I'm not leading you. I'm just asking you questions. That I have, I have like- no problem telling anybody anything. I'm pretty much an open book to a fault. Do you know what I mean? I'll tell you my whole fucking life story in an hour because I'm that's about to just, ask you. it's not an issue because that's just the way I am. But I think a lot of people feel like the way I feel, but they don't talk about it. They'll never talk about it. They'll stuff it under and they'll keep it deep and they'll never go there. The way that I've been able to stay a semblance of having sanity is to talk about it. When I put my feelings into word words, when I put my nightmares and my nightmare childish experiences into words, it helps me diffuse it a little bit. It helps me forgive my father, forgive my mother for not protecting me and my brother, forgive a lot of, a lot of different things. My father also taught me a slant on religion that was really fucked up. <laughs> and he taught me, you know, that Jews are better than other people. At what? Every general. Okay. Jews are the chosen people of God. Mm-hmm. So Jews are better than everyone else, and people hate you and hate Jews because you're smarter and you're better than people, and that's fucked up. That's that's, that's so strong. That's so first of all, strong. I in all walks of life, I learned I was not smarter than people. I was not better than people. And the only thing I held on to that I heard was people hate me. People hate me. So then we come from Brooklyn. It was the... Hey, listen, he's not wrong. There is a long history. And in Twisted History, somewhere along the line, when I talk about any topic, it inevitably reflects back onto a point where Jews got fucked. Right. I mean, I don't care if I'm talking about plane crashes like twisted. There is there is. So I can as much as, you know, I can sit back here or people listening can sit back here and thinking that they can go through glasses of a Jewish uh, arms dealer from Brooklyn. I still love saying that out loud from the, you know, uh, mid to early 1900s. He's not fucking wrong. No, right? no, I mean, I, and we, and we listen, spend a lot of time talking about ovens on this fucking I, show. You I know? know, but there's a way I, I believe as a child, you can't tell a six year old. Right. That. You could tell a 13-year-old that. Mm-hmm. You can't tell a six-year-old. Wow. At six years old, he used to say, and, and him and my mother said, you have to marry Jewish to perpetuate your race. Otherwise, Hitler will come back in this country and wipe you out, and there won't be any fucking Jews. So I really that's was heavy. fucked up. Right? It was <laughs> that's like, heavy. that's a perfect word. It was so heavy because I was very keen and very aware of what he said. Because uh-huh. as a young child, you know, my mother and father were always fighting from... I, I, since I'm three years old, mm-hmm. they were always arguing, and I took it as money. As it turns out, it was, it was much more dynamic than that, much more other things, but I picked up on money because it was very simple, money, money, money. Mm-hmm. And um, I felt just so pressured and just so fucked up, and I was so scared of everything, like really scared. And the craziest fucking thing is we move from Brooklyn to Massapequa, Long Island. Deek. Uh, March 26th of fourth grade. Okay. And I think it was 1970. And my father goes to work. We have this beautiful house now that we're living in. We were living in a little apartment. Now 
we're living in this fucking mansion. You can't, you know, like for a kid from Brooklyn that had no money. Now we have a fucking house. Was it a mansion? Looking back on it, was it a mansion only because of where you came from? Like, in, you um, live in a mansion now. It's still, I mean, no, it wasn't that. No, okay. it was tent. No, absolutely not. Okay, it was not a mansion. Mm-hmm. But it was a, but it was a basic house, nice right. house, nice backyard. I had my own room. I didn't have my own room when I we lived in Brooklyn. I grew up in a Brooklyn. in Brooklyn, too, when we moved out of our uh, apartment in the Bronx, Bronx to Brooklyn. I lived in a, in a mansion in Brooklyn, too, that my father had bought. And now by, I've been to your mansion. The place I grew up was nowhere near that. So I'm just trying to give people perspective because they know that you enjoy the finer things. So you moved to Massapequa, where you go to All-American Burger right. for the first time. And now <laughs> what happens? What changes? So the first day we're there, my mother um, goes to Dairy Barn. With me and my brother. Yeah. And Jerry Bowman used to buy the gla- the milk in the glass mm-hmm. and the iced tea in the glass. And we come back to my house. And the word kike is written in the driveway. Oh, Jesus Christ. From crab apples. The word kike. I didn't know the word kike. Mm-hmm. I didn't know it. People used to call me, when I moved, when uh, after this fact, they called me a dirty Jew. Mm-hmm. Uh, a Christ killer. Uh you know, that Lots type of, of thing. But I never heard the word kike until that second. And my mother started hysterical crying. And I'm like, what does that mean? She goes, she goes, don't worry about it. So we walk to the front door. And at the, um, at the front door, there's a umbrella that's hung on the gutter. And it's filled with stuff, but we don't really know what it is. So my mother puts the glass milk down and the glass iced tea down. And she opens the door and she hits the umbrella and rocks come down and crash the milk and the iced tea. Now she's a fucking basket case. She fucking brings me and my brother in the house like the house is being shot. Right. Now, everything my father has ever said about people hate you, people hate Jews, is now black and white. Now it's not, now it's not supposition. Now it's not words. I'm looking at it. So me and my brother are hysterical crying. My mother's hysterical crying. My, father, my mother calls my father comes fucking home from work and he's fit to be fucking killed. He's fit to kill. Goes to every house in the fucking neighborhood, finds out who did this and he's fucking spitting and screaming at these fucking people. And from that point forward, from fourth grade to fifth grade to sixth grade, I had a major problem in the fucking neighborhood because first of all, the, I was the only fucking Jew. There was very few. Let's say we lived in a, a development that had 430 houses, one way in, one way out and it was like 10 Jews. And everybody else was non-Jews. But when I say non-Jews, the way I took it as a 12-year-old, you know, 11-year-old in fourth grade was that everyone hated us. So, and the kids hated us because their fathers punished them for what they did. Because, you know, like, in other words, whether the fathers were anti-Semitic or not, whether they got this attitude from the parents, you know, now they've been sort of exposed, even though it was the 70s where, you know, people didn't give a shit about anything. Um... It really fucking fucked me up, and it really, like, wrecked me for a lot of years. A lot of years, you know? And so I had Stu, all that's this- a, that's a, I mean, I don't mean to make you out to be a better storyteller than you are, because people know that you can spin a tale as good as anyone. You remind me of my father in that way. That's a 50-year-old memory. And I feel like I was fucking there. No, I remember. And I've been to the Dairy Barn. I know the exact type of houses that you're talking about. And I know what the neighborhood of Massapequa was back around the time I was born. I was born in 1971. So that's a 50, that's 50 year old luggage that you're carrying around for a guy who is not naturally hateful. And this is the point that I'm going to try to make before you go on. I don't find you as a guy that I could take advantage of. As a matter of fact, you and I have talked about taking advantage of other people. In jest, you know what I mean? Like, let's get this, you know, like something like that. We, we talk about that type of stuff, almost like a grifter type old school mentality. You're not one that I think that I can take advantage of. That's a compliment. But you're very quick to forgive. And where does that come from? Like, where does, and, and I don't mean to rally back to your father and say, like, maybe you're giving him too much credit or something like that. So where does your forgiveness of your dad to begin with and I'm assuming maybe even the people of Massapequa because you don't seem like you hate people even though you got like a 50 year old memory of having rocks break a bottle in front of your mother maybe they ripped off a mezuzah and put kike in the thing where does that come from your ability to forgive so easy because you're not a pushover well so what happened was in seventh grade Jesus um, this is specific again in seventh grade I finally just cracked and I snapped and I got angry and I said, I'm going to beat the fuck out of anybody who ever gets in my face. 
And w- so in other words, when I went to Hebrew school, I only hung out with the Jewish kids from Hebrew school. And then you had this whole other crowd. That was the in crowd. That was the sports crowd. That was the good looking crowd. That was the non-Jewish crowd. And one day, this kid came over to my house and he opened his mouth and I just beat his fucking head in. So then he got like four of his friends to come over. And then like two of them jumped me and I beat the fuck out of both of them. Then the main ringleader of the group, who oddly enough became my best friend and was in my wedding party, stuck, stuck up and he wore bl- I met steel tip boots. He was the first person I've ever got kicked with. And I was ready to kill this fucking kid and he kicked me with his steel tip boots. Well, then I grabbed him and I fucking was pounding him. The other two jumped on me and they broke it up. And then after they broke it up, they picked me up and they said, you're one of us. So from that point forward, I learned that at that level, violence was the only way I could survive. That I had to literally be an aggressor. Like any time I fought anybody because I was small, like I had a ton of fights in seventh and eighth grade. Like I'm talking every week. I must have had fights every week. I must have had like 100 fights in 7th and 8th grade. I fought 7th graders, I fought 8th graders, I fought ninth graders, I fought 10th graders. My brother was a complete fucking wise ass, year younger than me, and he eventually became much stronger than me and a really good fighter. Um, but in 7th and 8th grade, when he was in 7th and 8th, he used to have an open fucking mouth, big mouth, my brother's gonna kick your fucking ass, so they're older brothers. I fought, had to fight every week at the fucking dead end where we lived, every week three times a week, just fight people. And in those days, you fought someone until there was a significant situation and then everybody said, stop. And then you became friends with people. It's not like it is now where somebody's gonna break their arm or stab somebody, you know, you you beat someone until they're unconscious. That's never what it was. It was a fair fight. It was literally 30 people sat around, they loved it. It was like Stu Fine is fighting John Simmons on fucking Friday night at the dead end. Everybody would come down, drink beers, we'd have a circle, get in the middle of the circle. And I would swing. That's like my son Alex keeps saying, how the fuck do you think you're so tough? You're not so tough. You're a fucking little guy. You're going to get killed. I'm saying, you know, like, you know, you don't realize what I went through when I was in seventh grade. That's my life. Seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade. I think most people, the majority of people who listen to this podcast are probably uh, younger than I. Certainly younger than Stu because he's so fucking old. And I can't envision, like, the, the amount of times that I've been in fights as a kid were a handful. You know, I've had a handful of them. And, and they were, you know, they were life-changing for me. And I know people talk about fighting all the time, but very few people actually. I got into a ring in college, so I've done that and I've done all that. To, to be consistently fighting, not for your life, but to be consistently fighting as a kid does do something to you. I mean, I think it does harden you and it doesn't go away. It's almost like a trip to prison, right? Where you all of a sudden, people change after the fact. Where were your parents when you were running this mini uh, anti-Semitic fight club from (laughs) sixth to eighth grade in Massapequa, Long Island? I mean, were you coming home with a... You know, a gold chain ripped once a week, or having to go through something like where? Where was where was the parenting then? They didn't. They as long as we were home for dinner, they didn't give a fuck what we did before and afterwards. Okay. As long as our grades were good in school, they really didn't care. They were checked out. You know, they literally were checked out. My mother, like I've told my kids this a lot of times. My father was very physical with us. He'd come home. We. My mother would always make us eat at the kitchen table with my father. So we never ate dinner until he came home. Don't finish that thought. How, how good of a cook was your mother? The best ever. Your mother was a good cook. No, no, the, no, no, the fucking best ever. Your mother was the best cook ever. Ever, ever. The be- what type chick- of cuisine did she do? Fried chicken cutlets, rice aroni, Velveeta cheese omelets, tuna salad, chicken salad, egg salad, um, a giant meatloaf, like she'd make a burger that would be a fucking a meatloaf. First time Sandy came over my house, she was 16. I was 17. My mother gave her a whole chicken and said, eat whatever you want. She gave five chickens. It was me, my father, my brother, <laughs> my mother, and Sandy. <laughs> Same as my get, fucking a, get a fucking chicken, and then I'll make chicken salad out of the rest of it. And like my, my, my wife, my girlfriend at the time, she said, it's something wrong with your fucking mother. And my mother was like almost 300 pounds. She was like 280. Oh, she's a big woman? Oh, she's a monster. Okay. She's a fucking monster. Like when, like when I, I, No, no, don't, please don't go any further because the reason I brought that up is because I regret that I cannot 
take your mother to J.P. Graziano's Grocery Store in Chicago. They're one of our sponsors right now. J.P. Graziano's been around for 83 years. They're an Italian sub shop. I don't know if you're... uh, if you're close with the guys from Chicago, but they do the Chicago beef kits. You ever see when they do this stuff in the slow cooker? I, you know, I'm a, I'm a cook. Right. I'm a gourmand. Mm-hmm. I have a great palate. It's one of the few things that I have that's great. A great personality and a great palate. And I'm telling you right now, and Annie says, yeah, pretty big cock. This place does simple stuff as good as anyone. I, I'm telling you, right here, the Italian beef seasoning. This is supposed to go into a slow cooker with your roast and whatnot. I put it on everything. It just gives you, instead of going through dried herbs, give that a smell. Everything that these guys pump up. That's delicious. Particularly the Jardinera is as good as anything I've ever tasted in my life. So I fry eggs with the oil out of the Jardinera. I make the Italian beefs and I put them in tacos where I obviously put on a little bit of pickled jalapenos and some goat cheese. I do all the asshole stuff. But straight down the middle, down home Italian deli, if you can get to Chicago to visit these guys. But otherwise, I need you to go to tasterealchicago.com. And I need you to order either a beef kit or some jars of their Jardinera. And you will not be disappointed. I don't have any kind of code for these dudes, and I really don't want one because I want Jimmy Graziano to make as much money off of us as possible. I met this guy during the pandemic. He's one of the first guys to come on Mind Your Business, which was the precursor to the Barstool Fund. I was doing a small thing called Mind Your Business. Just a decent guy from a decent family who makes excellent fucking Italian products. So go to tasterealchicago.com. Get their pickled peppers, their fucking jardineras, anything that you want, and I guarantee you that it's going to be good. It's J.P. Graziano's. If you're in Chicago, stop by and grab a sandwich. If you're not in Chicago, tasterealchicago.com. Go to J.P. Graziano's thing and light yourself up. I needed to slide that in. That's why I purposely put it there. No problem. So your no mom, problem. 300 so wait, just, pounds me, and, great, and a great fucking cook. The, the best ever. But let me just go back to when you asked me an original question. Yes. You said... How did you forgive people? Why are you so forgiving? Right. So, um, when I was 23 years old, I got to 262 pounds. And I pretty much was going to die. I had a monster business. I immediately made a ton of money. My first year in business made a quarter of a million dollars. First year in business, just selling on the telephone, selling sports picks, okay? I borrowed 1500 from my father, 1500 from another partner who was 23 years younger than me. I mean, excuse me, 23 years older than me. We had two desks together, and I just killed. I fucking killed. First year, quarter of a million. Second year, half a million. Third year, I got, I got, I got fucking 35 people working for me. So um, because in my head that my parents fought so much that I said, if I make money, I got the world by the balls. That has to be the answer. Of course, I made the money, and that wasn't the answer. I was still crazy. So then I had to go into therapy. I went to this place uh, called, uh, it was uh, South Oaks Medical Hospital, and they had an outpatient program. How old? 24. 24. And once a week, I went to a meeting. And it was like an offshoot of Overeaters Anonymous, where they made you sit in a circle and we shared gut level with the people that were in the hospital. They were inpatients for months on end because they were morbidly obese. And they taught me how to verbalize my feelings. And they taught why but what there there is a thing back then when you were twenty four, there was a stigma to going to any kind of place. Like now, BetterHelp is one of our sponsors and all there is no stigma to going and getting help. To having a therapist. There was a stigma. What what led you there? Like now people be like, I, I don't feel good about the way that my dog died. I'm going to therapy. And one that's the, a good thing. But what led you there at 24? Were you violent? One, Were you fucking? One of, the, one of the salesmen that worked for me lost 150 pounds. And he. And, oh, because of the fat thing. Okay, okay, okay. And he said. Okay, okay. And he, and he said, go to Overy's Anonymous meetings. And I said, uh, there's no way I'm going to a fucking meeting. So I went to a therapist. Okay. And a therapist sent me to South Oaks. And I was there for six months. And uh, I, met, uh, I met Al Goldstein. 
which was the owner of Screw Magazine. Yes, yeah. Which is almost fucking killed me because he <laughs> took a liking to me and I ran with him and we ran really? into the Al city. Really, Al is an icon yeah, in the Ron, porn world. Ron Jeremy, who yeah. now is a pervert and he right. got arrested, but yes. I used to brag that I was buddies with him, that he loved me. And uh-huh. I don't really talk about this a lot because I was, mar- I, was girl- I was still with my wife at the time. Okay. And she was my girlfriend and whatever. Okay. He sent a limo for me and my wife on her birthday. We went to the 21 Club when you couldn't get into the fucking 21 Club. Right. We Rest went, in peace, 21 Club. Right. We went, you remember it? So, oh, I love we, it. so we, went, we went to his apartment, which was like at the time a 12,000 square foot fucking apartment in Manhattan with like $2 million worth of fucking every gimmick in the world there. Became very friendly with him. But in those rooms, um, they taught me that I was either going to die or I had to forgive. They said forgiveness is the only salvation you will ever have in your life. That if you do not forgive the people that harmed you, you're going to do something that's going to put you in a jackpot that you're probably going to be dead. So here's your choice. They wanted me out of my business. I said, listen, I'm making a half a million dollars a year. I got the world by the balls. There's no way I'm getting it. They said, Stu, this business is going to kill you. You're, you could do anything in the world. Your, you know, your energy is great. People love you. You have the ability to talk. You have to get out of this. This business is going to kill you. Right. Everything that has a compulsion in it is going to kill you, whether it's compulsive reading, gambling, drug uh-huh. addiction, sexual behavior, abusive language, compulsive spending, selfishness. But in those rooms, they taught me that unless I forgive, um, I'm going to die. So I have not been totally on board and there's still certain people that I hope die today and I would go to their We've funeral. About them. Right. I would go to their funeral and I would piss on the grave <laughs> in front of everyone and say, fuck you. Because you're not perfect. I ha- right. I'm yeah. not perfect. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. But the way I've been able to survive is they taught me. I've been to psychiatrists, Freudian psychiatrists that put me on a couch that forced me to talk. And for the first five fucking 10 sessions, they would sit there with a little book and I'd say nothing. I would fall asleep. And then they'd say, okay, session's over. Then they'd come back and they would force me to talk uh-huh. because I wouldn't talk. I would, why I became, I, I became a people pleaser because I also noticed that people like you when you're a people pleaser. If I'm super nice to you, if I'm super giving to you. And in addition to it, the way I would deflect anything about me is I would talk about you. And nobody loves to talk about themselves more than themselves. Right. So I knew, so I would just direct every question at you. I want to know about you. I'd ask you questions. I'd ask you things. I'd relate to you. And I would just bring shit out of you. You calculating prick. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. I was a manipulative fuck, you know. And then because of that, I had like a very great keen sense where people picked up on that. And then they shared things with me that they would never share to anybody else. Like I, if I could a thousand times people have said, I've never told anybody this in my life, but I just told you because that's how it is because mm-hmm. I'm able to do that. But it, 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 but it's because of, ad, it's because of my, not because I'm super smart and super, uh, you know, great to do it. It's not like that show that's on fucking TNT, that Lucifer show where right, right. the devil, you know, he talks to the people and they make, I, yeah, yeah. it's, it's because of my insecurities and inadequacies and fear that I didn't want you to not like me because I would immediately think you don't like me because I'm Jewish. You don't like me because whatever whatever the situation is. So, um, But do you still feel that way? I mean, do you still feel it's to a certain degree that anti-Semitism lies behind every door? I mean, I'm, I'm, yes, as, yes. I'm as Irish want, Catholic if, as they come. If you're as asking as me, here. if you're asking me honestly, yes. Really? Yes. I, and, I mean, and something is friendly let me tell you, as this. Let me, tell you, wait, let me tell you the worst one of... Uh, not the worst, but top five worst things in my fucking life. So it's my parents' friends are at my friend's house, and we're watching a Super Bowl. And there's like 10 guys, and they're talking. And I always was like a sneak. So I would put my back to my parents' friends, because then the fucking parents didn't have kids around. They didn't talk to kids. Right. They were like, get the fuck out of here. You know, I'm hanging... <laughs> So I would always, I would always be, I would always want to know why that was. Yeah. And I, so I was very, so untrusting that I thought that I better listen. So I turned my back and they'd be behind me. This is what they say. They say that fucking Jew who moved in down the fucking road, you got to fucking watch for him. 
And they would be like, and all of them would nod their heads like they'd be all like together in this group. And this is what they said. They said, you got to watch out for Jews because Jews are worse than N's because you can always tell an N, but you could never tell a Jew. (laughs) How old are you? 13. 13, you're fly on the wall at a coffee clutch where people are being extremely anti-Semitic. And, right? and they were they were brutal against blacks. They were brutal against any non-American. And it was it was and when I so when I heard every that, one of them are the son or daughter so, of immigrants. So and right. Yet so when I heard that, I was like, I didn't know what to do with that. I mean, that's crazy. That's it. Yeah. That's so. In other words, when you say like, how am I supposed to know? Like, like I don't know. I really don't know how people feel about anything. And now with the with the anti-Semitism coming back into this country more than ever, mm-hmm. now you see how people really feel. A lot of people feel a lot of things, but they weren't able to verbalize it. Now you see a lot of things that you're like, oh my God, that's crazy. And listen, I'm only Jewish by birth. I was never a practicing yeah. Jew ever. Right. I struggled to even make my bar mitzvah, make my haftorah. I bar mitzvahed my first two children, right? Because my mother... The guilt of my mother was on my fucking head. My wife's like, how the fuck are we raising these kids Jewish? You never go to Hebrew school. I mean, you never go to temple. You're not practicing. You can't speak it. You never talk about it. You hate it. You've told me your experiences with it. If anything, you 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 would have rather not be Jewish. Um, and it was the guilt of my mother just jamming it in my head and my father when my mother died that was it my mother died that was it my other two kids uh, we didn't even raise them religiously they were like be a good person that was you know that's pretty much what it was so you feel comfortable more now in a room full of jewish people than you like even i being an irish guy i can't just say in a room full of jews because sometimes that word jews can be used the wrong way there's a difference between saying jews and saying jews right you know what i'm saying sure but do you feel comfortable now or most unguarded when you're around the chosen people, I'm, or oh, I'm always got it. Okay, I'm always got it. I'm, I mean, it's just unfortunately how I work. Mm. I'm, the, you know, like in other words, I'm. The, that's that's why I've get, I can gain a hundred pounds. Me. Yeah, I mean, it's listen. It is part of my game. You know, the clown is always the fucking saddest person in the room. The funniest guy is always the saddest person. Right. I became funny. I became you know over the top. I became. Because of those, because of my insecurities I mean, and my inadequacies that have never gone away. Because I've never actually gone through the therapy and said I've actualized. I've always, there's always a little piece of me that's very scared. And it's fucked up my whole life, to be honest with you. I'm like, a, like another, I have an amazing life. I'm very grateful for what I have. I'm very successful. I got a wife that loves me 100%. half of the time. I got my four kids that love me and three of the four love me all the fucking time. And, uh, but, I struggle every day. It's why it's why that I always struggle with my marijuana. I struggle with my sugars. I, sh- I struggle with my carbs. For the last, let's say, over a decade now, my doctor has said to me, you're a diabetic. You can't eat sugar. Your A1C is 11, 12, 13, 14. Your sugar's supposed to be under 100. Your sugar's 200, 300, 400. And I keep eating sugar. I keep eating carbs. I keep smoking pot, which leads me into that. You know what I'm saying? In my 90s... Was your dad addictive? Was your dad... Uh, no! That, that, was, that was the craziest fucking thing. He was a complete... You said like, your mom was obese. He was, my mother with sugar and my mother was an, my mother was an overty. Yes, but never drank. My father... My father got diabetes in, when he was 46. And that second put down the sugars, mm. put down the carbs, right. put down four packs of Vantage cigarettes a day that he smoked and never picked Jeez. it up again. Never picked it up again. Like an, like a, another example. Like Stronger this, than you. Oh, but but he's like a dry drunk. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I he, that's exactly why he's a rage of like He's like, you know, he's, listen, my father is the nicest guy in the world. You would fucking love him. Like you met him. him but times. God, God forbid you see that evil side of him. He's fucking a lunatic. He's, to this day. To this At second. How old? How old? He's 84 years old. If you tell him the New York Giants and you say anything against Eli Manning, he'll fucking fight you. <laughs> In a wheelchair, he'll be spitting at you, trying to throw his, he'll break his tooth to try to throw it through your fucking eyeball. No, he's a psycho. Okay. So he's still like that. Another experience with being Jewish that wrecked me. So on Yom Kippur, uh-huh. you would fast for 24 hours. Good, yeah, Right, you know the deal. Yes. Okay, so my father 
would stop eating, let's say, for example, on a Friday night, okay, for at least seven, eight years in a row, that morning, knock down, drag out, fight with my mother, physical, verbal, hitting me and my brother. And then he would say, get fucking dressed. We're walking to shul. So then we'd have to walk to fucking shul. Crying. Me and my brother, Aww. scared shit. My mother never came because she was fucking either physically hurt or a, a mental wreck. Mm. And we'd have to sit in the shul where, until I came to Long Island, they didn't even speak English. So I had no fucking idea what was going on. He didn't give a fuck. He dobbined with all these other fucking psychos that probably, did, I don't know if they did the same thing because that's pretty, you know, that's damaging. I don't want to say that, but sure. I'm sure that he can't, but because he couldn't eat, he couldn't smoke, he couldn't do his things. I remember, I remember like one time he cut himself so bad shaving because he was such a wreck and he took the septic pencil and he kept trying to make him stop bleeding and he couldn't stop bleeding and we went to shul and blood was all over him and it was like it was like a surreal situation it was crazy so there's a lot of things that um relating to jewish relating to make me feel insecure and inadequate if your parents are always fighting so my fucking mother so i i so my fucking mother my i thought my mother was the best because she was loving kind loved us unconditionally my, fa- my mother, as I learned in therapy, was just as sick as my father because my, father, my mother used to say to my father, don't hit them in the face. Hit them in the stomach. Hit them where you can't see. So if they wear a shirt, we'll make them wear a long sleeve shirt so no one will see you hitting them. And, and, I, and in therapy, when, I, when this came out, my fucking, my, the therapist would say, that's fucking psycho sick. My mother also used to take me and my brother and put us in a, the car right in front of the house and... We'd pee in the back seats and my mother would be in the front seat and she'd talk through the fucking mirror. So she wouldn't be talking to her. She'd be looking at the mirror, but she, we could see her through the mirror. And she kept saying, this, is hap- this happened once a month. The only reason I went with your father is because of you two. Otherwise, I would leave him. Again, when the therapy, this is all, they said, this you know is how all fucking- serial killer 101. If you tell me that at some point in Massapequa, you masturbated to roadkill... Then I would go and check your freezers at home. <laughs> Honest to God, this is all setting up to be me interviewing somebody and the interview being done from a desk to behind bars. Listen, uh, and again, I'm, I'm going to take a break. This is the twisted history of Stu Finer. I'm thoroughly enjoying learning a peeling back the layers of this fucking onion who I consider my friend. And uh, and it's fucking fascinating. Allow me to go back, if you don't mind. Sure. Allow me just to no, backtrack no, no. just a little bit. Go. Fourth grade, sixth grade fight club. High school, where did you go? Uh, Farmingdale High School. Farmingdale High so School. I stopped- How far are you from Massapequa now, where you live? Five seconds. Right. Right, because where I was, All American Burger. That's two miles away from me. Yes, and then I was at Ralph's Ices. I got Spumoni at Ralph's Ices. That's like a mile away from me. Yes, and then but Palm is that I could hit a golf ball from my lawn to Palmer's when you were there the other the other time. And Palmer's is where we had gone for the uh, repast after uh, uh, cousin Les's funeral. uh, Rest in peace, Les. Um, So Farmingdale High School. Yeah, I stopped growing in summer of seventh grade, so I was the biggest kid in seventh grade. I was the toughest oh, kid in seventh grade. You were the grade. tallest kid at the time. I was, I was, I'm, I was five five in seventh grade, 150 pounds, and I was as strong as any ninth grader in the fucking school. That does explain the Fight Club ask type thing too, because you might have been a bad motherfucker. I was. Yeah, there's no, yeah. I, I, there's no uh, issue about yes, it. Yes, yes. But I mean, sometimes this, now you're no. si- you're sitting next to a six five, 300 pound guy. Right. Well, you know what I mean. Like people ninth, think that I'd be the fighter by tenth grade, because my high, my my junior high school was seventh, eighth, ninth. Okay. And me and my brother used to sit up at night and rank when I was in ninth grade. He was in eighth. Like, where do I sit? And there were certain people that were tougher than me because their fathers were boxers or their fathers were karate experts. So they knew things I didn't know, but they were not tougher than me. They were just better fighters. They were better street fighters. They were quicker than me. They knew when they get me on the ground what to do. And in other words, but by 10th grade, I was done. I was... I was looking up at fucking people. I was scared shit in 10th grade that I was getting my fucking ass kicked. Right. Because there were people I beat senseless in 7th and 8th grade, taking their heads, 
into lockers, blooding them, fucking pounding them. And now they're about six feet tall and you're still stuck around five, oh seven. My, yeah, five, right? five. Five, I'm five. Five, five. Right. Five fucking five. So they, these people are passing you in leaps and my girls oh, are passing you. Everything. Right. Everything. Everything. Soup to nuts. I mean, I was- I was high school though for you. Were you popular? Yeah, I was the po- most popular kid in school. Because in 10th, because in 10th grade, I had the best drugs. In 11th grade, What was I the had- first time you did drugs? Was the first time you had a beer? I was drinking Boone's Farm uh, in yeah. sixth grade because my friends had older brothers. Mm-hmm. So let's say we were in sixth grade. They had an older brother in eighth, an older brother in 10th, and a high school brother. So then that's how we got the wine. They would buy it for us. And then first time I smoked pot was seventh grade. And then first time I ate acid was 10th grade. I ate acid like 100 times in 10th grade. I went to school on acid. I went to school on mescaline. Really? Yeah. Mescaline the, whole ten, the whole 10th grade. Triple so I went heads. from, in 9th grade, the, the people were begging me to be in the debating club because I was the best debater in the school, best talker in the school, most popular kid because I was funny, only out of necessity. Were you a good student? I was a great student. I had 90s, straight 90s. I was about to blow up. Then in 10th grade, I got involved with hard drugs, which would be cocaine, acid, mescaline. Again, because my, my, my friends had older brothers that filtered it down to us. And we hung out with them and we listened to their music and the, our influences of all our music became from them. And uh, 60s, Sick, on every, 60s. The whole, all 10th grade. And it blew my entire academic career out the fucking window. Oh, wow. So I was like done. Grew my hair super long, hair halfway down my back. I became a freak. Now I was still able to be friends with the jocks right. because I used to be a jock. I used I was still What'd able to play. Um, I I wrestled seventh eighth ninth grade. Makes sense. I played baseball seventh eighth ninth grade, and I played football uh, ninth grade. And uh, and I played. What position you play in football? Uh, I was linebacker and running back. And baseball. Baseball is catcher. Okay. And. Uh, 11th grade, I got my shit back together. Okay. And I went into what's called informal school, free school. My kids make fun of me. It was like, that's where they put all the, all the kids that were, you know, something was wrong with them. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't my mind that was wrong with me. It was just that I got involved with drugs. And there was a lot of smart people in the informal school, too. Number three in the school was there. Number five in the school was there. Number 10 in the school was there. You were able to take all your 11th and, grade, uh, 11th and 12th grade classes on your own. You would go when you wanted to the classes. You would do all your homework on your own. And you would have like, you would have limited structure where you'd have to come in on a Monday and a Wednesday or a Tuesday and a Thursday for certain classes. And I was able to excel in that environment, put the drugs down uh, pretty much as far as hard drugs. No, no. You've always been recreational though since. Oh yeah, no, mo- marijuana. Marijuana yes. is my marijuana is my. Because you're not a big boozer. For people, no, who I don't drink. That, you don't drink. I don't drink. You have a champagne drink. if you have to be out. Yeah, with no, no, I love fruity. love champagne. Yeah, love champagne, but I'm not a drinker. I'm not a drinker only because I drink and it makes me. All I want to do when I drink is eat. So I might as well just fucking eat, or it makes me like fall asleep, right? Or it makes me do things that I don't want to do. Like if I have four beers and I'm with my and I'm with friends, and all of a sudden I'm making out with my buddy's girlfriend. You know, like I would never do that. Mm-hmm. I could do be on quaaludes. I'm not doing that. But on on you ever beer, had a quaalude? yeah. Oh yeah, we did quaaludes all 11th and 12th grade. The uh, unbelievable, awesome. <laughs> the best, the best. They would zonk you out, once. zonk yeah. you out. Like yeah. you know, like in other words. So in other words, uh, you know. So you go to this other school. You go through tenth and eleventh grade, twelfth grade is your senior year of high school. Right. You I graduated? met a guy. I met a. Oh yeah, got, yeah, absolutely. And I went to college, Nassau Community College. You I went got to a four o. Community. I got a four o. Okay. Um, in eleventh grade, I met a guy. Me and my wife Sandy went to Madison Square Garden. Our, be, our favorite band was Genesis. Their album at the time, Phil. Um, Peter Gabriel left the band two years earlier. He left in 1975. And then Phil Collins Commons went out. from the drummer, right, to Behind the, the, to the front man, right. And they came out with an album called And Then There Were Three. Mm-hmm. And our love song was Follow You, Follow Me from that album. Right. It eventually became our wedding, our wedding song. We met this guy, George. And this guy, George, sells us Seventh Row Center at Madison Square Garden for $40 each. Sandy was working at a bank. She always worked. And um, 
I paid my own way. We each, you know, Dutch, 40 each, and we saw that concert. He gave me his card, and it, he said to me, if you could bring down people from your high school and wait online, I get the connection when the tickets go on sale. And then I get the connection when they used to give out these ticket stubs for the next day. Mm -hmm. So he was a ticket broker. I worked for him. I would have hundreds of tickets per day in my room because of him. He would front me the money. I would buy the tickets. I would get a free ticket, great seat, first five rows to anybody who worked for me, and, and $10 or $20, which at the time- in A lot the, of money. A lot of money, exactly. The ticket was only $10, $18. So then I always had people buying the tickets, and I'd ha always have cash. It was never my cash. It was his cash. But I would always be behind. You know, like Then tickets, concerts would go on sale six months in advance. There'd be 50 shows. I'd have like- 15 tickets per show. I'd have, I'd have hundreds of tickets and thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars. Never my money, but his money. So I always had first five rows. I always had money. I was spending his money. I floated his money 11th grade, 12th grade, first year of college, second year of college, third year of college until I owned my own business. You know, at one point, I was in a $200,000 hole to the fucking guy. And I really? paid him and I fucking paid him every penny. Because I would just burn my money, and I would, and and unfortunately, that taught me how I ran my business. Okay, to just borrow money and float money and make my profits and burn it and spend my advance money now. Right, because I was, I was always very, I always never wanted what a to fucking lesson. Though. Never wanted to miss anything. Right. So in other words, if I couldn't afford it, I borrowed it. That's it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to miss a fucking thing. That eventually put me in like a seven, eight million dollar hole as I got older. That only because I'm great at what I do, I was able to bail out. I owed the I owed the mafia one point three million dollars. You're for jumping ahead. No, no, stop. Oh, go. Stop Sorry. it. Stop it. You casually mentioned somebody. You casually mentioned Sandy's name. I'm going to have to get into that. But before. Roman swipes are convenient. You don't need them when you're with Sandy, but otherwise they're convenient. They're over-the-counter wipes that are clinically proven to help you last longer in bed. I keep mine in my Roman testosterone support uh, jar, all of them. All you have to do is rip these things open, swipe them on yourself, have somebody go like this until they dry, and then you're good to go. When used as directed, Roman swipes leave no scent or taste. There's no transfer to your partner. They're safe, effective, and no prescription is needed. Uh, all swipes orders include two day shipping that's free and they arrive in an unmarked package. All righty. So try today for as little as $2 and 75 cents per swipe. You know who steals mine as soon as they come to my desk? Who? Zah. <laughs> Zah blasts through these fucking things. He's putting it on that tripod cock in. God bless you, Zah. <laughs> yeah. Shout out, Zah. I fucking love you. <laughs> Try the swipes today with a special offer just for our listeners. Go to GetRoman.com slash Twisted today. GetRoman.com slash Twisted today, and you're going to get 20% off your first order. That's GetRoman.com slash Twisted, 20% off your first order of your Roman swipes. But I'm telling you right now, this is not on the uh, script. The GetRoman.com um, website is fascinating. There's a lot of shit on there, and everyone needs a little bit of help, whether it's the hair, whether it's the testosterone, whether it's the swipes. GetRoman.com might be the exact place for you. So give it a whirl, and then use the uh, code TWISTED for 20% off the swipes. See if it works with other shit. Who knows? But it's Get Roman. Let's get back to Sandy, because Sandy is an overarching theme in your life because you've been together with her arguably too long if you're talking about her she should have let you go years ago and took half of everything that you've owned <laughs> and then you're fucking walking on uh you're walking on thin ice with her uh, for the past how many years how long have you known sandy um 44 years going on 45 years okay we, so we're married 30 dinner? we're married 30 uh march 11th 1978 was the first time we kissed we went out 10 years in a day, and we got married March 12th, 1988, and uh, took her to the prom. See that? She was third prize prom. prom queen. And, uh, you know, she was a 10, and I was a 6, you know, pretty much. That was it, you know? Like, I've if, seen the pictures. You're an 8. You're <coughs> an 8. You're a strong 8. 
well, I'm an eight if you like men under five, 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 five and under. Most most women, like, you know, like I said, Hannah, do I have a shot with you? Stu, if you're over six feet, but you're, you know, seven inches shorter than that. So that's pretty much reality. Women, especially when we were younger, women don't like short men. Like, you could be a billionaire. You could have it all. You could be the best fuck, and I'm a good fuck, because I'll go all the way. I'll I do know, anything. I'm I'm as good as there well, is. Well I've, I've watched porn. I was at porn sets for, I know how they fuck. I was as good as them. Not as big, but people don't like, women don't like short men. They what don't. About like Bruno Mars and Tom Cruise and all these guys who are just gigantic celebrities, even though they're not gigantic guys. Certain but, women won't go out with them only because of their money. They are for their money, but not because of their height. Most women how are- How come I didn't do better with the ladies then? I'm a gigantic, no, I'm just joking. I, I, I got everything that I want. You're large, right baby. There. You yeah. have it all. Annie, so you, you got it all. But uh, so- You so, meet her. So I meet her. So this is what happens. It's one of the greatest stories ever. It's literally one of the greatest stories ever, and I'm it's in my book, it. so it's not it's not like some. Oh, fan. hold on, let's plug some shit. I apologize. Don't worry about it. I don't need. I don't need. I don't need to plug. We'll do it, it at this end. moment. Yeah, I don't need the plugs at this moment. So, <laughs> March 9th, we go to Farmingdale Bowling Alley, and I was a very good bowler. I was a 170 bowler right out of the box in 10th grade. My father bowled with the uh, with the Jewish League, and he was a pretty good bowler. And he taught me how to bowl, and I was a good bowler. Mm-hmm. So we go to the la- we go to Farmingdale Bowling Alley. And there's this fucking girl there, Sandy Olson, blonde hair, blue eyes, just the greatest fucking ass you ever saw in your life. I mean, pants so fucking tight, they were the, her skin. And I was just sitting there and I couldn't wait to go home to jerk off. That was the only thing I'm thinking about mm-hmm. because I didn't have the balls to talk to her. I didn't have the balls to make a maneuver. I was a virgin and there's just no fucking way. So I see her and I'm fucking drooling. I go home. I must have masturbated between March 9th to March 10th, like uh-huh. literally like 20 fucking times, like yeah. no bullshit. So then March 11th, me and my buddy go into, uh, we're at Farmingdale train station and we used to go to Central Park to meet our drug dealer. His name was Mountain. He was six seven with blonde hair down to his fucking ankles, and he had two Doberman pinches. And he had he would take a frisbee in Central Park and throw the fucking frisbee, and the dogs would get it and come back. Right. So he sold what's called blotter acid. Blotter acid, yes. Where you would take out from a little thing and you'd put a circle blot, and it would circle. So we would buy on an eight and a half by eleven. A hundred circles of blood acid for a hundred dollars, a dollar each. We would go home and cut them in quarters and sell each cir- each quarter for a dollar. So making three hundred fucking dollars every fucking week just off of this. And they all went because it was the there best was fucking. Do so you had the supply, but there was a ton of demand. Oh my god, couldn't get it. You couldn't eat it enough. People were eating it like it was fucking candy. There was a lot of drug. My my graduating class was twelve hundred people, so there was at least two hundred complete fucking drug addicts eating acid every day. We we tripped we tripped every fucking day, every day. So. I, all of a sudden, it's me and this guy, and it's me and this guy, Tom, and we're there. And all of a sudden, his girlfriend shows up, and these other two girls, one of them was Sandy. I'm like, I'm like, I'm scared shit. I don't say a fucking word to her. We go to Central Park. He's not there. We Mountain's go, not there. Not there. So we go to a place called Brew and Burger. $4.95, all the beer, wine, sangria you could drink, uh-huh. and you get a shrimp cocktail, you get a... Uh, a salad, you get a cheesecake, and you get a fucking burger. Wow. We get annihilated. I'm talking, I can't even fucking see. I'm so drunk, so out of control. On the train home, I say to Sandy, I say, excuse me, I say to this other girl, Eileen, same age as we were, I said, I really like Sandy. And she's like, you're so fucking slow. That's why she's here. I was like, what do you mean? That's why she's here. She's like, she really likes you. i like, what do you mean? She really likes you. No, no, she likes, she like, like, I'm looking, like, she likes me. Like, I'm looking behind me. She's like, right, right. oh, you're talking to me. She likes me. I'm like, so we get off the train and we kiss. And that was fucking it. Jesus Christ. That's and that fantastic. Was, and that was fucking it. You know, so we, we took it to the prom, took it to senior banquet. We both went to NASA Community College. When I, when uh, my second year in business, when I needed a bookkeeper, she quit her job working at Citibank and she came to work for me and she was my bookkeeper. She got her sister to work for me, her second sister to work for me, her brother-in-law 
ran my office. Her father came to work for me and really built my business like that because I was so untrusting with people that at least I could trust her family. Sandy Jewish? No, Irish awesome. Catholic. Yeah. Irish Catholic. Right. If you're asking me right now, who are the, who are the most trustworthy people in the world? Fucking Irish. Yeah. I trust fucking Irish yeah. unconditionally. What's up? You're fucking Irish. What's I trust up? you. My I don't. I don't. Born in Ireland. I have no. I have no. No second doubts about it. Everyone else, I'm a little eerie. Oh, I can't wait to. Read Irish, this and then wrong. believe it or not, the second people I trust the most, Italian. Jews with muscles. Irish and Italian. <laughs> Literally, exactly. <laughs> Irish and Italian. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Because everybody's always afraid of the mafia. By the way, Sandy Olson. Yeah. is an all-time name, <laughs> especially around that time. Like, Sandy Olson is a fucking all-time Well, name. it's spelled O-H-L-S-S-O-N. Oh, that sucks. Because she's Irish and Swedish. Oh, really? Her father was Swedish. Mm -hmm. Her father was a 6'3 Swede, 320 pounds, fucking 22-inch neck, fucking hands like a killer. Really? And he was a killer. Him and his brothers so, were fucking killers. So, jilted... Go ahead, Can Annie. We just acknowledge the fact that that's the same name as Sandy from Greece. Yeah. Yes, Sandy they Olson. used to they used to call it. It was that's it was awesome. Sandy Dombrowski, Sandy Olson. Yeah, exactly. I love that. Exactly, they made fun of her forever, like Rest literally in peace. forever. Rest in peace, Sandy. Olivia Newton John. Yes. Yeah. Shout out Olivia. So a guy who doesn't trust anybody now all of a sudden falls in love and then trusts this girl who he's got stars in his eyes for. Trust her family completely like you wound up hiring them and having them taking care of your most treasured thing at the time which was money right because we spoke about 100%. how money is going through so then that that sort of broke a little bit of the mold a little bit 100%. by the way are you okay with what we're talking about 100 percent. anything okay. goes any and i'm gonna the, i've never told the story before so i'm gonna tell the story right please now. so buckle in just to show you how tr her, her mother was a alcoholic okay and um if you got her mother on your side, like she was a Met fan, I was a Met fan. She was an Islander fan, I was an Islander fan. She would kill for you. Like fucking kill for you. Like she was a wreck, but super smart. But, and she, she raised her family with an iron fucking fist. Like she would yell and those girls jumped. She had, Sandy had three sisters. She was okay. one of four. So Sandy works for me. And I'm not going to tell exactly the particulars because now that you can get in trouble 100%. forever. Yes. You know what I'm saying? It used to be I, would, I could have told this story, but I can't now. Something happens. We did something wrong. Okay. The FBI comes to my wife's house and my, and my mother, my future mother-in-law, Sandy's mother, is at the kitchen table. And they're grilling my fucking wife over... Whatever. My fucking mother-in-law, Sandy's mother, says, listen, you motherfuckers, get the fuck out of my house. My daughter ain't answering another fucking thing. Go fuck yourselves. And threw the FBI out of the fucking building. Right. <laughs> From that point forward, I wouldn't give a fuck if the woman was throwing up on me. Fucking, that Jesus. was it. That was it forever. And she was a wreck. When my How far into a relationship is this now? When that happens, the FBI visits, you're, not, you're not engaged yet. 1983. No, okay. So you're just. Dating. I got engaged 1986, 1983. So five and years. She's in. already riding heavy with you, Mrs. She, Olson. Yeah, a big. T she loved me from Jump Street. Right. The father, her, uh, Sandy's father loved. They loved me from day one, from day fucking one. I I hate to keep bringing up parallels, Stu, because I don't know if you want to be con compared to me. But one of these days when we're sitting around a table, I will tell you the story of when I was convinced about her. Because it's, I, and I think that people who are married who are listening to this have that come to Jesus moment. And uh, there are some people who are not sure whether or not they should get married to their loved one because they never had that come to Jesus moment. And nine times out of ten, I say, then don't fucking do it. <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? Like, even when the mom tells the FBI to go fuck themselves on behalf of the daughter's boyfriend. And she had every right to hang me out to dry right there. Like if, like if, if it flipped the wrong way, yeah, I don't want too many. I don't I'm just want too saying, many details. I'm, I'm gone. I'm like, <laughs> are you? I'm gone. You're gone. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm in. I'm, I'm in jail. Really? Like if it went the wrong way, they if they s went that way, I'm How gone. How the fuck did you survive? 
it seems like I'm a survivor. I really am a fucking survivor. Like, I and mean, I, we didn't touch on the nine million in the hole. We just touched on the FBI. <laughs> like, we did talk about you fighting your way out of fourth million. grade, seven, seven million. million, whatever it is. Do you feel that you have a, a rabbit's foot shoved up your ass? Because it seems like you're um, you're a fucking cockroach. They well, can't kill you. Well, it was like, you know what it is? It's like... In the best possible way. Right. No, no, no. I understand. It, it's like, um, first time I met Dave Portnoy. Okay. He's a big shot. He's always been a big shot. Mm-hmm. And he's always a tough motherfucker. He's not a guy that you want to get on your bad side. He's not a guy you want to fuck with. And he's never a guy you ever, ever, ever want to embarrass. Especially embarrass him in front of his crew. Mm -hmm. And so I've always had a way about myself that the bigger they are, the more I don't give a flying fuck. Whether when Donald Trump was like my casino host. When he was dating, Mar- when he was dating Mar- Marla Maples, you and, then the he, bus, right? and then he married Mar- right. Then he married Marla Maples. He literally, I would lose a hundred thousand. Give me another mark. I'd lose another hundred thousand. He would come over to me because I made the guy so fucking nervous, and he liked me. He's like, Stu, you have to come down. He'd take my whole crew, send me to the Scheherazade restaurant, which was on the floor of the Baccarat pit, which was the high roller pit, and he had an insane restaurant. And why Donald was so successful with his hotels, even though he eventually bankrupted mm-hmm. him, but that was for a totally different reason. Yep. Um, he gave away the store and he knew how to treat people. So um, I believe, my point being, I'm battle tested so that I'm not afraid of anything. Because I'm not afraid. You know what I mean? Like, I'm afraid, but I'm not afraid. So my point is like, when I went... The reason I'm so successful at Barstool Sports and the reason that Barstool Sports Vice is so successful is my first time with Dave, I got in his fucking face. I mm-hmm. said, Dave, you're a fucking scumbag. I said, fuck you. You ain't, when you walk in this fucking room, you ain't better than me. Right. You're not bigger than me. I'm bigger than you. You know, and that's, so in other words, in a sick way, uh, because of my insecurities and my inaccuracies and my insane life, it's given me an air of confidence so that even within a room of billionaires, I'm okay. It's not fake confidence. So Stu is kind of glancing over some stuff, and um, I'm realizing that we're not going to have enough time. But like Dave was a huge fan of Stu's, mm-hmm. as were anybody who was a gambler. Him and his father used to watch my TV show. Yes, they used to watch Portnoy my Sports Advisor TV show. Yeah, so if this wasn't Stu coming in as a as a stranger and doing that to Dave. Which no, I'm think- one of the I'm one of the main reasons that he opened Barstool Sports Advice is because he he looked at me and loved the gambling and loved my entertainment value and really in his head that seed was planted that he wanted to do this. Mm-hmm. So I was one of his main reasons he opened Barstool Sports Advisors. And I, I mean, and uh, Barstool Sports. Barstool Sports. And I, and I believe that to be 100% true. Take that to the bank. But I don't, I don't want to lose sight of what I was saying with uh, Sandy because I want to just go down that road. And before you went off to Trump, there's so much fucking shit we could talk about. So Sandy and you get married when? Uh, March 12th, 1988. And the reason and that, 12, that the, I was very ago. insecure of always Sandy leaving me because again, she was a 10, I was a six, but she proved herself in a lot of different areas. We would go to bars and in bars, when she walked in a fucking bar, everybody took notice. She would wear high heels. So she's only five, three, but she'd wear six inch heels, five inch heels. So she's five, nine and she's drop dead gorgeous. I don't give a fuck who you are. She looked like Michelle Pfeiffer at her fucking best. She was a killer. And she had this beautiful blonde hair, beautiful blue eyes. Her makeup was always perfect. She, her clothes when she dressed were always perfect. So we'd be in bars and people right in front of me, like we'd be at a bar and they, the, uh, guys would literally push me away and start hitting on her right in front of me. Now, I can't hit this guy because he's good. I'm, I'm, this guy's twice my size. You know, then, you know, I'm going to get killed. So I'd have to just wait. I'd literally have to wait it out. <laughs> like, I couldn't even say to the guy, hey, that's my girlfriend. Because a couple of times he think, he goes, hey, hey fucking uh, Topo Gigio, get the fuck out of here. Go find the plane. Because they that when that guy with Ricardo Montalban, when he had his little guy, right. they, they, they would, like, degrade me because I was tiny. Yeah. But she proved herself because she never went that way. You know what I mean? She did what she had to do, and she just was always very, very loyal. So it was... Uh, 
Although I was always in the back of my head saying, ah, God, this is the shit's going to fucking hit the fan one day, but it never did. So, I, you know, I feel blessed with that. I feel grateful for that. It just reminds me, and I, I'm going off on a little bit of a uh, left turn here. Doc Pomus, have you ever heard that name? No. So he was a, he was a songwriter, and um, there was a song called Save the Last Dance for Me. It's a beautiful song. Oh, I know the yeah, song. Save yeah, yes, the last yes, dance for me. Yes. So uh, he was married uh, to a woman, and then he came down with polio, and uh, he was he was uh, stuck in a wheelchair for most of his adult life. So if you next time you listen to that song, you can listen to it now, knowing that he's talking about you can dance, go carry on. To oh, the I didn't know that. Okay, so now I understand. Like, but don't forget who's taking you home and in whose home you're going to be. Please save the last dance for me. And that was that guy, and. Um, so it's kind of extraordinary. So you guys get married. You have how many kids? How quickly? Um, we went to Italy for two weeks and a cruise for two weeks on our honeymoon. How wealthy are you when you get married to her? I was pretty, I was pretty good. I was, you know, I had a couple of million in the bank. Okay. And uh, I had a business. That's very good. That was writing like 60,000 cash a week and then another 50 on the books. We were killing. <laughs> you know, we rocked. And... Um, come home and we said oh we're not having kids this is great we're not gonna have kids for a while this is fucking great all we're gonna do is tour the fucking world kids stink she's pregnant the next month oh jesus so then um so we had our first child immediately you know nine months after we got married yeah. or 10 months after we got married and then um had alex in 19 so that was he was born 1988 Alex was born 1991. Alex is here with you now yes. doing some social and whatnot. Yes, Alex runs the entire business. He's the brains I of the operation. Alex. He's yep. the glue that's held me together. You know, 100%. for 20 years he's been going. Why do you keep fucking up your life? You know, because I do self destructive things. He's like, Dad, what you know? What? But he's kept unbelievably me... level headed. First of all, just just a great kid. Like he's yeah. a great kid. I've no, spent some the... time with him, particularly when you left me for dead on the boat that time. What? Uh, but I spent so much time with this. <laughs> I love I love the kid. So whenever he's here, it's an absolute pleasure that you know that you have him in tow so often. And I think you're right; he's probably one of the most positive influences in, in your life outside of Sandy. Oh, right? No, now. absolutely. Right, right. No, no two ways about it. He mm -hmm. saved my life fifty fucking times, mm -hmm. and he's put up with. You know, I, I swear to God, Alex, I'm never going to smoke again. That I'm sitting there with a blunt. I'm never going to do coke again. I'm snorting coke off the fucking, the you know, the uh, right. engagement picture. You know, whatever. He's put up with a lot. I'm not supposed to eat sugar. You know, and he doesn't let. He really doesn't let me bullshit him either. He doesn't give a fuck he'll be angry at me like literally fucking not talking to me and we 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 work together every single day six feet apart for right. you know I, almost a decade every fucking day and if he's angry at me he'll just freeze me out he won't <laughs> fucking talk to me it's like so uncomfortable i'm like and i can't break him because he's fucking pissed you know right you know when you piss him off he doesn't let it go like i let it go he doesn't let it go you know he doesn't forget shit like right. i have to wait him out I'm you're like, a fucking elephant though too i mean speaking with some if somebody was to do the same grilling to myself perhaps annie perhaps alex who's a younger guy I don't think we've had this vivid recollection, but I don't think that we've had so many things that could have potentially, like I said before, drive us over the edge either. So then you have Alex. And then, and then Ryan is born uh, 1995, and then John Allen is born 1999, so I have four sons. Four sons. Yes. So, so you have four. So that's a nice-sized family. you got a nice-sized business going. Do you mind if I pivot over to no, the business? anything. Okay. Talk to me about the business. Talk, so talk to me about how a guy who all of a sudden gets himself in a little bit of um, money trouble spending somebody else's money as a ticket broker, for lack of a better, because you weren't a scalper, right? It was, well, the, well, I mean, was, he was a scalper. I was a ticket. Well, I sold his tickets. Yeah, you scalper. Yeah, right. you worked for a scalper. Right. And, you, and so you had a lot of cash on hand, and you spent a lot of cash on hand, even though it wasn't yours, learned a lesson from it. And then you had gone into a point in um, society where, and this is what I like to do when give people perspective. When Stu Finer had started, Stu Finer's never been a bookie. He's never been a bookmaker or anything like that. All Stu Finer has done is tell people how to bet what he finds to be intelligently. Correct. To, you know, and people can argue that all they want, but that's exactly what Stu Finer has always done. But when he started this business, you got to remember... Nobody bet legally back then, Not one right? Person. Like now it's, you know, sports books and apps and, and stuff like that. Bookies were a big business and that wasn't your business. But I remember particularly working on Wall Street, like when I was clerking for Sean, like all of a sudden I take the paper bag 
and I'd bring it down to a bookie, and it'd be filled with cash. Sometimes I'd go down without a paper bag. He'd hand me a paper bag and be filled with cash. Then I'd go down with another paper bag filled with cash, and I'd come back with a paper bag filled with pills. Like, this is the, the, the life that we had led at the time, right? So you have a bunch of people gambling million, billions of dollars in the United States illegally, and they want a little bit of guidance, it, that's the whole idea behind what Barstool Sports does. If you want a little bit of guidance and you want a little bit of entertaining, hey, tune into us. I'm going to Kansas for the race. Uh, somebody just hit me up. Oh, I like Byron in the thing. I'm like, shit, I'll throw a couple bucks on Byron. People just want a little bit of guidance. That's what you took advantage of. And you were one of the first people to take advantage of it. Not take advantage of it, like take advantage of people. Take advantage of that market. How did you do it? What age? Give me the little bare, uh, bare bones on that. Okay, 19. No, hold on a sec. You can't give me the bare bones on that because we're about to talk about money. And if we're going to talk about money, where the fuck do you keep your money? You keep your money in a disgraceful old wallet like everybody else? Why? Go to Ridge Wallets. Look at this fucking thing. I, I look at this. God, and so you press on that, and then all your shit comes out. It's like, it's like the goddamn space station, right? So wallet technology has gotten to a point where you can have something that's slim, something that's minimalist, and something that is perfect for what you need to carry your cards and your money for those people who still carry cash. If you go to Ridge Wallet, you'll find over 30 colors, styles, carbon fiber, burnt titanium. There's over 50,000 five-star reviews. Every one of them is made of a durable material, which means that each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty. You can go to Ridge.com. It's pretty easy. R-I-D-G-E.com and use the code TWISTED for 10% off any order that you have there. They sell some other shit too, but it's these wallets, these goddamn wallets that give me a hard on. This is the one that I'm sending down to my son because I got it in Alabama's colors, uh, Roll Tide Rush Pike. And I'm telling you, go to Ridge.com and it's that RIFD blocking technology that protects you from digital pickpocketers. All the stuff that you need to have an intelligent wallet that a man should be holding, you'll find it at Ridge Wallet. That's the last ad I'm doing today. So now we're going to go to your business. How did you go and take advantage of the fact that people want to bet and they want to bet and tell Intelligently. That's what I'm busting out the junior mints. Um, so I'm 19 years old. It's 1980. Okay. And my father was a big Raider and a Viking fan. And No, thank you. And um, I became a Raider fan and my brother became a Viking fan. 1980, uh, it was a Friday night before the Super Bowl. The Raiders were playing the Philadelphia Eagles. And me and my father were 100% convinced the Raiders were going to murder them. It was not a, it was not a supposition. It was a fucking cold hard Madden's fact. Coach? No, John Madden only won one Super Bowl in 1976. He retired in 1978. So now it's Tom Flores as the head coach. And um, Dick Vermeil was the coach of the Eagles, and Ron Jaworski was the, um, it was the quarterback for the Eagles. And they were very uh, nationally liked. And the Raiders were a very dirty, very bad team, meaning the players on the team were ex-criminals, Literal, like, thugs, hoodlums, great athletes, but psycho people, the worst of the worst. And so you had good against evil. And we watched this guy named Ed Horowitz come on TV, and he said that he was an accountant. And he made a million dollars creating a short-form tax form that he made a million dollars on. And he took the money and put it into computers um, to pick sports picks. So I'm like... That's fucking amazing. God, if I could do that, I want to do that. That's the greatest thing ever. So then this fucking jerk off goes on for like two minutes and explains how the Eagles were going to kill the Raiders. Eagles were a four-point favorite. And I'm like, there's no fucking way that's happening. I said, I, like, everything this guy, I was so happy about this guy, so excited. It was like, wow, this is what I'm going to do for a living. And then this clown starts talking about the Eagles. I'm like, there's no fucking way. Me and father, like, this is a joke. We were going to call the station up and go, listen, get this fucking guy off the air because he's terrible. P.S. The Raiders murdered the Eagles. It was never close. It was like 32-14, but it was never that close. And really, if you knew anything about football, anything about anything, well, the odds makers didn't think so, but I, we knew it. I knew it. I knew it like fucking guaranteed. I would have bet your life on it. I said, if this guy can be professing to be an expert on the Super Bowl, no less. The biggest game in the fucking world at the time. The biggest. And he could be that wrong. I'm fucking going into this business. That's how I went into the business. I went to work for someone that was an offshoot of this clowns. 
and uh, work. You call him a clown, but he's the reason that you're a millionaire. No, 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 no. You but call him a clown. He got you. His he listen. In truth, he was a great guy. Okay. He was a very talented individual, complete cokehead, extremely <laughs> funny. When I say a clown, his selection on that game was clown-like. Okay. It was his selection on that game was so dead wrong that you cannot be wrong on that game. You just, it's just, you can't be wrong if you do this for a living on that fucking game. Like, like this, I'm 19 years old. There's no fucking way. The Eagles can play that game a million times. They're never win. They didn't win one fucking play from the line of scrimmage. Stu, I'm talking, it was a rout. Stu, people can't do what you do because they don't feel the way that you do about it. Like, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people, you know, bet against I went to Notre Dame I'm not Captain Irish but I've kind of seen like you know that kind of bias or the bias go the other way we're noting I've never felt so fucking so strongly about something like that and I don't think that the most I mean use the term you know very widely degenerate gambler I mean a bad gambler I don't see them getting so worked up about it that's what separates you if you didn't find this if you didn't find this and you went throughout the rest of your life running a deli, it would have been a huge fucking loss to mankind. I honestly, I believe that. And I don't bet a lot. You know, I don't bet a lot. I, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's funny when people find what they should be doing. So, so you find that this guy is a moron and then that decides the rest of your life. Right. That's going to decide Pretty now. much. It a year later, a year later, I borrowed 1500 from my father. Yeah. I mean, this guy, it's 43 years old. We put two desks together. Mm -hmm. And then within a year, we wrote like $700,000. We each made a quarter of a million each. And we're off to the races. So much so that in 1984. But, but, so, okay, desks are back to back. Use, use kids. Don't understand that. Desks are back to back and you just have phone turrets and you're smiling and dialing? Correct. Like, where did you Correct. get I your. Bought, I bought a list. You bought a list. I bought a list from someone. And then I bought another list from someone. Don't skip this, Stu. Nobody fucking buys lists anymore. Alec Baldwin came into your fucking Glen Gary, Glenn Ross type thing. Billy and Baldwin he was had, in my business, by the he way. He had the, who gives a fuck? Right, okay. And he had the leads. Right. And you bought the fucking leads. Correct. You bought the fucking leads. Correct. Nobody does that. And then you sat down with another, not near stranger, and you sat down and you started smiling and dialing and said, for some reason, I'm Stu Finer and you're not, and I really think that the Eagles are going to fucking lose in the next game also, or, or whatever. Well, that, That's, that, that, go ahead. By that man being so wrong on that game gave me uh, the keys to the kingdom, meaning that I want to be on the opposite side of the public's opinion. I want to be on the right. underdog side. I, would, I want to be on a shit team that can't win against a better team. And I won incredibly, like, in an outrageous way, where not only did I win, but I won with a fucking game you would never bet if your life was on the line. So that showed a skill set over other people. Mm -hmm. like, if, like, if I gave you a 10-point favorite and they won by 12, or they won by 60, won by 20, but if I give you a 10-point favorite... If I give you a 10-point underdog and that underdog wins the fucking game, you're going to say that fucking guy knows something. Right. So because of that guy being so wrong on a favorite, I went to the underdog. I always want to be on the short side. I 100 people in a room. I used to fucking go, when I was 21 years old, I used to go to a fucking bar and sit there like a fucking jerk off asking everybody in the bar who they liked. And I would have a counter in my head. And whoever they liked, I went the other way. And that was my pick. Whether it was college football Pro football, college basketball, pro basketball. Which what's your favorite sport? What's your favorite sport to bet right now? Is it pro football? Is that the major league baseball is my favorite sport by I, far? Yeah, you've told me that before. By far, it blows it's not my even mind. close. It blows it's my not mind. Not even That's close. Major league baseball. Major league. I could watch a fucking horrible, horrific, the worst baseball game ever, and just sit there and enjoy it because it's the only sport you can relax. See, when I'm on offense, you can't score on me in baseball, so I'm okay. Right. When, I'm on, when I'm on defense, I don't got to worry about anything but defense. 
uh, those other sports is so quick, so fast, so right. many points are scored, so many up and downs. Basketball's a nightmare. Football, I could be winning the whole fucking game and make one simple mistake and that game's over. Right. It's not that dramatic and catastrophic in baseball. Baseball, you have nine innings, you got 18 half innings, you got fucking batters. Each fucking batter could take 10 pitches and you're just living on every single pitch, every nuance of the game. You align your... You know, you're, you're the players, right. it's an ama- to me, it's tenfold the best sport. It's not even close. It's so much better. Basketball, I can't even, rel- I love basketball. My most money I make is college and pro football by far. Second most college and pro basketball by far. Baseball, I make the least. I make 90% less money in baseball. But what do I enjoy? That six-month grind of that whole fucking baseball season. I live and die with 162 games every single night. And I love it. I I, can't get enough of it. I think it's trite that sometimes we preach um, responsible gambling, or at least people sometimes feel that it's trite when we're constantly promoting gambling, gambling, gambling. But Stu does walk that like he talks it. He's told me multiple times, what are you comfortable betting on a game? And I'd say, you know, I'm like a $100 a game guy. He's like, why don't you do 10? You're never going to get rich gambling. That's, that's, that's Stu's thing. Yeah, Stu one, tenth, never- one tenth of what your normal bet is, that's what you should be betting. Because gambling is for the rich right. to have fun and lose money. Right. There's no When you talk gambling, there is no winning. No one wants to hear that, though. But there is no winning. You're talking gambling. It's not winning. No one wins. There's two types of gamblers, a liar and a liar and a loser. And that's it. <laughs> right. But but people should gamble. They should post up at Penn Gaming until they're blue in their fucking face. Post up 5,000, post up 10,000, post up 20,000. But bet minimal amounts. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy the it, highs and lows. It you can have everything. You it, could have just as much fun betting $10 a game as you can betting 100000 a game. The sick fucks, the sickos, the people that live in delusional world that want to score out to buy a house, score out to buy uh, a car, score out to buy something for their girl or their guy. Those are sick people because that's not what the game is invented for. The game is the greatest game ever. Everybody should fucking gamble. You should be taught how to gamble since you're three fucking years old, which is when on when on Dave Portner's show last week, I said, I want to meet with the head of Penn Gaming. I want to get a fucking school. From seventh grade, I want to teach these people right how to fucking gamble, even from sixth grade, from fifth grade, from fourth grade. The point with gambling is the money that you wager is psycho crazy for most people out there. They bet 10 times, 50 times, 100 times over their head. And then they blow themselves out and reload. You're blowing out your entire bankroll in life that you should have for other things. That when something real comes along, you don't have the money because you lost it fucking gambling. How much money have you made in your career? How much money have you made in your career giving people kick... uh giving people picks and guiding people towards what they should be doing in the gambling circles. And this is coming back to what you're saying. I did not interrupt I've you written, on what you I've stopped. written about... How much have you 80, written? I've written about 80 million and I've made like 27, 28 million. Okay. Do you have 28 million right now? No, absolutely not. So if you didn't waste that on gambling, which I don't believe you did... Uh, I've lost. I've lost like six million gambling. A okay. real number. A real number. That's, is six that's, million. That's a real number. A real, three million. Three million betting on sports. Three million casinos. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we're going to talk about that. So what is the vice? Where is your biggest waste of money as a guy who makes a lot of money trying to help people make money, even if they're having fun, but trying to have people make money and enjoy the gambling experience. Well, my my. Where does it go? I'm, I, I was spending up until when my wife grabbed me by the balls and said, I'm going to fucking leave you, you psycho fuck. Um, I spend like all my money before I make it. Right. There's every single day I want to go to a concert. I want to go to a show. Yep. I want to go to a sporting event. I want to go to a restaurant. I want to take people out and have them enjoy their lives I on things. I fucking hate Broadway. <laughs> Broadway hates me. I'm six foot five and nearly 300 pounds. I do not like Broadway. Stu Finer said, have you seen Hamilton? I said, Stu, I don't fucking like Broadway. Have you heard the, it's, it's, what are you kidding me? I'm taking you in any Broadway. So we're fifth row center. We have the, um, the fucking vault room at uh, Capitol, Capitol Grill beforehand. You know, the cars up, the, the whole, f- I snuck in cans of beer into the fucking, <laughs> into the thing. I, I loaded up cans of 
So that's the answer. So even though he does have a, you know a real gambling number and stuff, you say, is it hypocritical? No, he spends money on things that make him happy and comfortable. 100%. Yeah. And he spends it immediately. Immediately. Listen, I live, I mean, it's, listen, I don't want people to Not do this. Not me. I, I don't live, do that. I live like I'm going to die tonight. <laughs> yeah. So tonight, if I'm going to die, I'll spend 5000 at a restaurant. Right. I'll take 10 of my friends right. to Hamilton. I'll spend thirteen, fifteen thousand, like it's but Not even blink. And I'll be good dying. But if I die. You were there with O'Malley, her two kids, like her two sons. Shout out O'Malley. Um, like, I, and listen, I don't have a lot of money. I have a little bit, you know, whatever. I didn't go to my fucking hip. I tipped a waiter. Like, that's all I was doing. Like, that's all I was doing. Honest to God, I bought beers to sneak in. It's, it's unbelievable, the generosity. It's, and that's the whole thing. I think it's almost to a fault. Alex, do you agree with that? Maybe the generosity is that is that fair to say? Can I? I'm, I mean, I'll of say what I want about you. No, I'll fucking course. take no, listen, it right now. Everyone says it. It's but it's just the way I roll. It's right. just it's just the I, I would have legitimately if I invested my money and I did the right things, I would literally have a quarter of a billion bucks right now. It's not even an issue. But I don't care. It doesn't mean nothing for me. I've had four million in the bank when I was twenty six years old. Didn't do anything for me. It, I looked at the bank account. And I peep these financial advisors would meet me and go, Stu, we have to take 10% and put 20%. And I'm like, are you out of your fucking mind? I got to go see Neil Diamond. I'm going to see Neil Diamond 20 fucking shows in Barbara's, a row. Barbara's New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. <laughs> I'm taking fucking yeah. 20 friends. I need, you know, like, I never forget it. I met a financial advisor and he said, oh, well, how much do you make a year? A million three. Okay, so let's say 400,000 taxes. We got 900 grand here. So you should easily be able to save 500,000. No, no, I spend 500000 entertainment. <laughs> what do you mean you spend 500000 entertainment? But no, no. That's I, what I do. But was the 500000 in entertainment, 500000 entertainment that allowed you to make 1.3? Like, that's a, no. that's a different no. thing. No, this, right? no. Right? You spend no, money I never, to make money. I, no. Okay, I spend, you spend money to spend money. I spend money <laughs> just to have that, in, like, in other words, people want to see Bruce Springsteen once. I've seen Bruce Springsteen 200 times, okay? Right. They want to see you two twice. I've never twice. seen him. Really? I'm just joking. I don't want to see him. Oh, really? I do not want to fucking see him. But I like I like oh. saying that because right away, <laughs> and this is my point, I don't want to see Bruce Springsteen. I don't hate Bruce Springsteen. I just have no desire to go see him. And um, as soon as I said that to him, he said, really? And all of a sudden, hey, Alex, can you find out when the fuck Bruce Springsteen is coming around? <laughs> and then I uh, get on my, uh, honest to fucking God. I, and by the way, I shouldn't even go down the saying, I'm not going to Bruce Springsteen with you. I'm not going to Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> so, so, so that's the thing. Listen. <laughs> ah, fuck. So, so Stu Finer, okay? So Stu Finer, um, Only Stu is a podcast that he's going to be pumping out, and it's on Spotify. Um, the, the football show, the Sports Advisors, Barstool Sports Advisors, is now kicked into full effect and uh, you'll be seeing him every week with Big Cat, Dave, and the rest of the crew. You can go to StuFiner.com. Right, for all my picks. StuFiner.com for all his picks. Be like Stu.com for all my merchandise and all my shout-outs. The main thing that I make money on right now, I kill. I'm the biggest in the world. I'm the biggest in the world with shout-outs. I charge the most money. I'm the biggest in the world. I shout-out people for their birthday, for their anniversary, for bachelor parties, for fantasy football, for deaths, to anything that makes you happy. You graduate from high school. A guy breaks up with his girl. He's a wreck. A girl breaks up with his guy. She's a wreck. They call me up, and for two to three minutes, I make that motherfucker happy. I change their fucking lives. And that's what I do at BeLikeStude.com. You buy a shout-out. So the greatest thing I do, the most enjoyment I do, uh -huh. is doing fucking shout-outs. Do, I, and I'm the biggest in the world. Not the day, not the the fucking, there's nobody bigger than me. If Tom Cruise right now said, I'll do a shout out, be like, fuck you, I'm taking Stu Fina. I'm gonna That's my favorite doing, thing I'm I do. I'm going to start doing shout outs. Fuck this guy. Absolutely. I'm going to undercut him because he, I see You can it. undercut me. This people is how do, I brought People him charge in. 20 bucks. They'll still pay me a buck 75 for me to sit on my fucking diving board, shred fucking 10 people in a fantasy football <laughs> lineup, dive in my fucking pool for 175, and people get back to me immediately and say, Stu, I should have paid you more. That was the greatest fucking thing that's ever happened to me. You fucking made our lives. What's the What's the website again, though? B B E L I K E Stew dot com. Be like Stew dot com. Stewfinder for picks. 
be like stew.com for the shout outs um barstool sports advisors which is a continuation of the project that Stu had made his millions at Stu finer yes. sports advisors basically a continuation correct only Stu is on um spotify i don't know if it's on the other platforms just yet apple and spotify um I'm, I, I don't. I don't believe we've scratched the surface, right? I mean, I haven't spoken well, about. Well, listen, every I Wednesday, about Joey Diaz. I've been every I haven't Wednesday. About, you haven't spoken about so mafia. That, the mafia. Ca- I was trying. Oh uh, uh, fuck! I didn't speak about the mafia. So listen, listen this every is, week, every week, every yes. week. I'm coming here every Wednesday. I could come on every Wednesday. We could do 16 weeks in a row. I got fucking. No, I got 16 stories. This is stories. my thing. You fucking jerk. Go to fucking only stew. Listen to his podcast. And hear about the fucking mafia thing, like, like, like this is the whole deal. Let's let's branch it out a little bit. I'll come on. I'll speak to you if you. Uh, I, you, I would love you on. Oh, okay. What are you fucking. You're a little bit more excited when I said fucking Bruce Springsteen. That's no. all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never saw Bruce. How did you ever see not Bruce? Thunder Road, Born to Run, Glory Days. Are you fucking kidding me? So, uh, so, so that's it. Let, Stu was a uh, was a landscaper. He's a landscaper for probably one of the more successful people that I know about. The guy from Grumman, right? William Schwindler. Yeah, so this he guy invented Schwindler. Grumman Aerospace, World War II fighter planes, this vice presidents were in my basement for twenty years. He, he was he a built fucking, all the fighter planes for World War II. He we won a, the war because of him. He was a stud. He was an absolute stud. I, I don't think I mentioned him in the World War II episode. I, we had done the one with the guy who invented the landing boats. Guy from New Orleans. Um, but Grumman was. He used to cut the guy's fucking lawn. And this at the time, again, he's living in Massapequa in a modest house and doesn't have a fucking pot to piss in or a window to throw it out, to be quite honest with you. And he tells this guy, Grumman, someday I'd like to buy your house. And then when the guy passes away, I think in his will, he said uh, that uh, that he very- reached out to me. Yep. 7.8 acre state. I bought his house. Bought, and he remembered some Jewish guy in seventh grade said when he dies to reach out to me, they reached out to me and I bought his house. 7.8 acre state. And, and, and that's I mean, the this, house that you see right now on Pardon My Take. They came, you know, it's an insane place. I've been there. And the last time I left, he says, hold on, hold on. And he gave me 10 pizza pies <laughs> on my way out. <laughs> he's just a fucking, he's a character. He's one of my favorite people in the world. I consider him a close friend. I hope it's not a one-way I relationship. I love you. Oh, I would die for you. Uh, I love you and your family. You're this the best. is scratching. Roll the, tide you know, roll. This is scratching the uh, uh, surface on the twisted history of Stu Finer. It's the first time that we've ever done this. We're going to go and uh, go back to regular <laughs> history. <laughs> regular scheduled programming. But I'll tell you what. I, I, I don't think, and please, Alex, Annie, I don't think anyone has ever sat down now for an hour and 40 minutes with Stu Finer without him saying the word clit once. <laughs> it's unfucking. <laughs> don't say it. Don't fucking say it because I wouldn't be the only one to say it. I won't. Thing. It's unfucking believable how much I got out of this. And I don't even know if it's that extraordinary on my part or if you're just an extraordinary guest. So thank you so much, Stu. Um, want everybody to continue to t- uh, tune into everything that we're doing on uh, social media at Twisted History. Obviously, go and support all of our sponsors because we love them so much. Tune into Stu whenever you can, and we'll see you guys next week. <laughs> <laughs>